Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage with Kirsten Wiley the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. I'd like to invite everyone to join us again tomorrow at 1.30, if you can, in this very room. We have Dean Kamen coming tomorrow to speak about two things, about his current projects, um, which are a water purification system, and, and also about his, um, his involvement with FIRST and getting kids involved in robotics and science. So that will be here tomorrow at 1.30. But today we welcome Stephen Levy to Microsoft Research to discuss the design, the creation, the success, and the cultural impact of Apple's most successful product. When Apple began work on this project, they saw the device as an enhancement of the Macintosh computer. Yet within four years of its release, it would change Apple from a computer company to a consumer electronics giant and change the music industry along the way. By 2005, Apple had sold more than 42 million iPods. I think it's over 60 million now. Over 90. 90 million. Oh, man. And Apple stock prices increased more than 700%. What is it about the iPod that made it one of the most successful products in world history? What pieces and people came together to create it? And what was it about our society and culture that welcomed it so intensely and immediately? Stephen Levy has written a book about it called The Perfect Thing. He has covered um, technology for Newsweek for many years and has written five earlier books on technology, including Crypto, How the Code Rebels Beat the Government, and Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. Please welcome Stephen Levy. Thanks. Well, thanks, Kim. And it's uh, great to be uh, on the Microsoft campus here uh, talking about the iPod. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, normally in a talk, I, one of the first things I do is I ask, well, how many people here have iPods? But someone might be taking pictures, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to refrain from that there. Uh, you know, as, as Kim said, is, you know, what, what is it about the iPod? And that's really the question I tried to tackle when I wrote this book there uh, about this one, one device. And it actually sort of crept up on me. I, I never really thought I'd be writing an, another book focusing on Apple. I did a book uh, on the 10th anniversary of the Macintosh, uh, you know, about that computer um, called uh, in, "Insanely Great," and you know, uh, but the iPod, you know, came out uh, without as much fanfare as you'd expect. Uh, you know, looking back on, on on the thing, and it wasn't until really, I guess, around 2004. When it wasn't even my idea, someone else at Newsweek uh, said, you know, we should actually do something big on th this Apple iPod, which is becoming sort of a cultural phenomenon. Uh, the, when I did that story, uh, I began to think that, you know, actually there's something maybe worth doing a book about to explore just those questions that, that, that Kim was talking about. So I, I want to talk a bit about how I grappled with this question of the, you know, the iPod, how a device becomes a huge phenomenon. You know, sometimes people talk about how uh, Google tipped its in, in, in power in the economy when it became a verb. You know, you Google something on the Internet. And the iPod isn't a verb. No one says, well, I'm going to iPod this song. Uh, but it is a metaphor, and, and in a couple different ways. We talk about uh, the iPod of X. Uh, I remember a headline you know, recently in the, in the New York Times. They were talking about uh, apples, the fruit. And there was one strain of apple which became very popular. And they said, well, this is the iPod of apples. Um, you know, getting a little uh, pun in on that. And so that means it's almost synonymous with success. Just think about that. Because when you say, oh, this is the iPod of jeans or the iPod of apples, you know, that means, wow, it's really super successful. And another way you hear the metaphor is people talk about the iPod generation. And think of that, you know, using a, a device, a consumer electronics device, to refer to, you know, like a whole generation uh, of, of people. Traditionally, people use it uh, to describe young people and saying, well, you know, this is the iPod generation. And, you know, more specifically, I talk about it in the context of this is a generation maybe that you know, has a short attention span or, you know, jumps from one thing to another. So it's also interesting how it maps an attribute of the iPod and describes that 
to describe the behavior of a whole generation. And that one aspect, incidentally, is something that I think is really, really important, is sort of key to the iPod, which is the shuffle. And I want to talk about that because how I came across the shuffle really was instrumental in my relationship with the iPod, which, of course, uh, shaped the book there. Um, so I'm going to talk for a while and probably not talk as, as long as I normally do because I suspect that a lot of you have some really great questions and I'd love to get in, into the discussion about some of the issues uh, that the iPod brings up or maybe even its competitors. So uh, the iPod came out just over five years ago. My book came out on the fifth anniversary um, and it was October 23rd, 2001. And you know, if you think about that time, you know, October 2001, you remember that that's only a few weeks after an incredibly traumatic, tragic event here in, in this country. Uh, uh, and living in New York City, of course, has had a, uh, an unbelievable impact on us. And writing for Newsweek, of course, uh, it you know, was also very much at the center of my work life as well as uh, you know, the personal life of, of, of living in New York in the aftermath of 9-11. So when I got this email... Uh, you know, in mid-October, saying, well, come to Cupertino, California uh, for a product launch. And they said, hint, it's not a Macintosh. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't as, as enthusiastic as I normally would be to go even to see a performance by Steve Jobs. Normally, I'm a connoisseur of his performances, which, you know, are very, very special. And, you know, he's really got it down to a science, you know, with everything down from the, the, the turtleneck and jeans to, you know, the, how he rolls things out. Uh, I went to this, you know, uh, one in January and, uh, where he did the iPhone. And I was sort of amazed that you know, he started at 9 a.m. And when the whole thing was done, and it was basically just him on the stage with maybe a couple of very quick visitors, uh, that I looked at my watch, and, you know, and, it, and it's 11 o'clock. And, you know, normally, like two hours with some guy, you feel, you picture Fidel Castro kind of like just going on and on and on. And, you know, and this is endless. But the time, pow, it just went like that. So, uh, and quite often, very cool things come out of one of these product launches. But this time... You know, because of 9-11, whatever, I, I just didn't go. I just couldn't bring myself to get on a plane and go to Cupertino and listen to Steve Jobs in, introduce a, a, a product. But fortunately, the iPod came to me. Uh, that day, Apple, uh, because I think a few other East Coast journalists, uh, you know, for, for went, for, for went, for gone, their usual trip to uh, California for a launch like that, uh, they had a courier actually bring iPods to a few select people in New York City. Of course, they would never put a device in a FedEx package and send it out because they were so paranoid that someone would open the FedEx package. I don't know what they were paranoid of, but we had a, a courier. You know, there was just no interaction except here's this package. Uh, and they dropped off not only an iPod, but th th this other box that uh, I found out what it was after I opened the iPod. And just opening the device, you know, you saw really what, a few of the things that make Apple special. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that uh, video of what if Microsoft had done an iPod. Uh, you know, uh, they showed the packaging there. And maybe some people in the room actually created that video for all I know. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, and that, that was something, in, in case you haven't seen it, where, you know, pretty soon, you know, it looked like, well, I don't know, a Windows box or something like that with all these stickers and, and you know, and, you know, this is in it and that's in it. Uh, but the, the, the packaging of an Apple product is done typically, you know, with as much, if not more care as the product itself. I've actually had the opportunity to, to, to sit down with Apple's industrial designer, Johnny Ive, who, you know, works on the packaging as well as he does the products themselves. And he'll go on, really, for, you know, for hours and hours and hours about how he did this and how he rolled up the, the, this cable and held this together and, you know, in, in theory, it's like the theory of how this thing opens up. And this box, it had a picture of Jimi Hendrix, kind of like, just like in mid-screech, right? And, you know, the, the, the box itself held some excitement. And, you know, it, you know, the way Apple packages things reminds me of, you know, the way you get uh, products in Japan. When you buy them, you know, you'll go into the store and buy an eraser or something like that and they'll wrap it up for, you know, for 15 minutes and then you wind up never using the eraser because it's so perfectly packaged. But I opened this up and uh, you know, there was like this device. You know, and here it is in case you forget what the original iPod looked like. Um, and you know, it, it, it really looked 
unlike any product like I'd seen before. Actually, compared to sort of thermostat looking, right? You know, with, with, with the wheel there, um, you know, sort of a space age thermostat. But compared to previous MP3 players, of course, this was not the first MP3 player. It wasn't even the first hard disk drive MP3 players. It looked totally different. You know, the, the one uh, hard disk MP3 player that I always associate with sort of looked like, you know, uh, a, a much bigger, uh, you know, disk man, right? You know, sort of looked like, like blown up, and, and you would never think of uh, exercising with it in any case. And, but, and it was kind of clunky and, you know, the, the zero interface and, and a lot of other problems. But you know, here was this, this iPod. And it was actually preloaded. It had been open before. And they put songs on it. But to uh, make sure that we knew that they weren't stealing songs, it had the big package of CDs this, you know, with the music. They actually uh, like, like ripped and synced uh, to the iPod. And it was kind of interesting. If you know anything about Steve Jobs, you know he's sort of a taste Nazi. So it was interesting to see what CDs they actually put on the, the iPod in, 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 in this case. They had, a, you know, like, of course, it was the Beatles, right? Even though to this day you can't buy Beatles on, on the iTunes store. But, you know, it had Hard Day's Night, nice touch, kind of fresh, right? And then uh, it had Bob Dylan, which, uh, if you know anything about Steve Jobs' taste, that made perfect sense. He just you know, adores Bob Dylan. Um, and it was just the right Bob Dylan, too. You know, like the 1966 concert at the Royal Albert Hall, right? So, uh, you know, and, and even the... The genres that you would think are sort of unstave like like country and western, he had a, like a faith hill, which is you know sort of okay and uh, you know and you know so the, and then Ella Fitzgerald who sang at his fortieth birthday, so you know they were all the right choices, and so you could listen to it right away, which was actually fortunate for me because that night I was attending an event uh, that I wanted to take my iPod along to now remember. We're going back five years in the time frame, uh, a little more than five years. And that was the launch of the Windows XP operating system, right? You know, long time ago, that long ago. And uh, they had a little event for journalists that night uh, where uh, we could come and have dinner with Bill Gates and, you know, talk about this launch that was going to happen the next day of uh, Windows XP. So I took along this little fellow because um, I didn't know whether Bill had seen the iPod yet. And, you know, we had our dinner, and, you know, uh, you know Bill was charming as always. And uh, after the dinner, the, where the rest of the folks were moving away, I said, well, Bill, have you seen this? And uh, I don't know if some of you had product reviews with Bill or not, but, you know, you know he, he kind of zeroes in on things, and, and he has a great ability to, you know, sense what, what, what's in things. And I almost compared it to... Uh, some science fiction movie, which I don't, I don't actually know what this fiction movie, science fiction movie was ever made or not, but it, it should be, where an alien comes to Earth and has an ability to like, look at man-made products and sort of suck up the information on them. You know, well, Bill's skill in you know, uh, uh, evaluating you know, new products is on that level. So he kind of ripped it out of my hands because you know, he had heard about it and hadn't seen it and immediately started like, you know, spinning the wheel and going through the menus and just kind of absorbing all the information, right? Like it was like a little time tunnel between him and the iPod and for like about 45 seconds like this exchange of information was going on at a rapid pace you could feel like you know the digits like flowing between Bill and the iPod and finally he handed it back to me and he said wow this is like a pretty good product uh, uh, it's only from Macintosh and of course back then it was only for Macintosh the iPod was made as part of the strategy that Apple had back then to create what they called a digital hub, which you know, meant that you had a series of programs that worked only on the Macintosh that, you know, uh, that aspired to do media better than you know, the competitor might have done media and, you know, and applications you couldn't find elsewhere. And this would be an incentive for people to buy a, a Macintosh. And they started off with uh, you know, a movie program, and that worked perfectly with the existing camcorders because they have the high-speed uh, you know, firewire connection that can really uh, very quickly and effortlessly get information from the cameras into the computer. But when they thought about going in, into music, uh, which is actually a category Apple was kind of late to, uh, they were very unhappy with the MP3 players that existed before. Um, interestingly, this whole strategy probably wouldn't have happened. This is what, one thing I found out when I was doing the book. Uh, uh, you know, the whole digital hub strategy and, of course, the iPod would never have happened were it not for Adobe. Adobe actually was responsible for the iPod because when Steve 
Jobs uh, came back to Apple uh, in 1997 and you know, had this idea that we're going to do you know, the media really great. He at first thought that maybe uh, third party companies would provide the software for it. And he went to Adobe and asked them, hey, you know, could you make a really great movie program for uh, the Macintosh? And they said, no, the Macintosh is too small a market share. It's just not worth our while to do this. Uh, we're not going to do this. And that's when Steve said he realized that we have to build these applications on our own. So that's, you know, was the origin of iMovie. And then, you know, iTunes, which actually was purchased, uh, uh, they bought a company which, you know, had a program which they changed into iTunes. And then when they saw that, that there was no good devices to play this music you can use on iTunes, uh, they decided to do a crash program to develop you know, something like this. And they did it in an amazingly short period of time. Uh, they actually began in January 2001. They had the idea, and you know, uh, Steve and John Rubenstein, who was the head of hardware at Apple at the time, uh, decided to you know, embark on this program. And they actually went to a, an outside guy, this guy named Tony Fidel, to put together the project. Uh, they pulled him off a ski slope in late uh, January 2001. Wouldn't tell him what they were bringing him in for, uh, but told him they wanted to you know, work on some project. And when he agreed, they, they, they said what it was. And he started pulling together the pieces uh, to bring together the iPod. And they said, oh, and one more thing, uh, we want to sell it this holiday season. We want to sell it this, this, this Christmas. Um, now, Apple... Yeah, you know, and this became clear to anyone who first saw the iPod. I did a few things that you know, differentiated this device from any MP3 player that came before. One of them was, you know, the same way they did with the camcorders. Uh, they used the high-speed FireWire to do a really rapid connection. As it turned out, the best previous. Uh, device was one which you know, most people never heard of called the personal jukebox. Has anyone heard of the personal jukebox? There's, there's someone there. Uh, it was done by uh, these guys at uh, the, the uh, Digital's uh, lab, Di you know, the lab for digital, uh, you know, the digital computer company, the research lab. And of course, digital merged with Compaq. And once that happened, there was this not invented here syndrome that the folks at Compaq, you know, like looked at this, you know, device with a lot of askings and, you know, and, and really weren't too enthusiastic about it. And then, of course, they merged with HP. And that was totally the end of that, which I thought was sort of ironic because actually they sort of had the makings of a very good uh, product. And, you know, they actually got some patents on uh, specifically the way the hard disk conserved energy when you, you know, drew on it uh, to, to listen to the songs. And my suspicion is, and uh, I talked to the guys who did the personal jukebox, who now work at Microsoft Research, uh, you know, down in Mountain View, actually. Uh, and you know, they, they in, indeed felt that their patents might have been broad enough that HP might have had a claim on this, which I thought was incredibly ironic because when uh, Carly Fiorina at one point announced that she was going to start selling iPods, you know, uh, on the company that called itself Invent, because they couldn't invent anything better, they actually had sort of invented. You know, something very much like that and might have had a lot more leverage in dealing with Apple had they realized that they might have held patents which uh, Apple was infringing upon in, in, in this. So that's, that's an interesting little sidelight. The other things were uh, you know, this wheel, which was originally the idea of Phil Schiller, who was Apple's executive VP of, of, of marketing, which is a great way to navigate the songs, which becomes a huge problem, of course, when you're packing a 1,000 songs, uh, which is what the iPod had originally, uh, on this little device. You've got to figure out how to get to the songs. And you know, this wheel, which accelerates as you turn around, this is a mechanical wheel. Now, of course, they're you know, uh, just touch wheels, uh, you know, w was a, a great way to, to get to your music. And then, um, you know, uh, of course, you know, there was the design of the thing, you know, the, the, the beautiful object, which Apple, you know, always thinks is very, very important. But as I was playing with the iPod, what really brought me over and got me excited about it was this thing called Shuffle. Now, it's interesting. If you look at the video of Steve's introduction of the iPod, his launch, which is a typical, you know, black turtleneck event uh, for him where, you know, he just said how great the product was and talked about uh, it, it, its virtues and, you know, how it was going to change the world. But he says that about everything. Um, the, uh, he didn't mention the shuffle very much. I think he just mentioned it in passing as sort of a laundry list of attributes that the iPod has. He actually spent more time on the idea that, you know, you could, might be able to use the iPod uh, as a hard disk drive, 
almost because the price was so high, four hundred dollars, which seemed incredibly high back then uh, for a device just listening to music. They, you know, you might want to think about doing it for other things too. But the shuffle turned out, you know, to be uh, to me one of the more exciting things about it. Uh, I quickly learned that you know, if you kind of dug down on the menus, you could shuffle your entire music collection, or at least you know, up to the 1,000 songs you could have in here, you know, just in a random order, what seemed like a random order. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, you, know, you wouldn't know what came up next. It could be really exciting. So I, when I got this iPod, I just started tossing in CDs into uh, my Mac and, uh, you know, and then synced them up with, with the iPod just to fill it up to see what it was like to have a thousand songs on this little baby. And I started listening to it. And I remember one day, uh, a couple weeks after I got the iPod, you know, uh, I got on the subway, which was mainly where I was listening to the iPod, going back and forth to work. Uh, and you know, this song, it was on shuffle, and this song came up. It was My Back Pages by the Birds. They you know, remember that, that, that song there? It's an, uh, their cover version of a Bob Dylan song. And I hadn't even realized that was on my iPod. I hadn't heard that song in a long time. And, you know, the Birds have this great sound, the sonic 12-string guitar, and, you know, and that song actually had a lot of associations for me, both in the Bob Dylan version and the Birds version. And, you know, uh, music has the power to bring all these things back to you. It's like, you know, Proust biting into the mountain, right? And... On the subway ride, this subway, if you've been on the New York City subway, you know, it's not normally a very exciting place, a very visually provocative place, but all of a sudden it went from like monochrome to black and white. Like that moment in The Wizard of Oz, right, where they go to Oz and the black and white beginning of the movie changes the color and you see the yellow brick road and everything like that. And that's sort of the, the, the power this thing had on me. It was really ex amplified so much more because I didn't expect that song was coming up. And you know, it just changed my day around. And, you know, I really got to get excited about that shuffle there. Though I actually did have a problem with the shuffle eventually. As I used it more, I found that specifically Steely Dan songs wound up coming much more than they should. You know, I, I would be on the subway and I'd listen to a Steely Dan, my old school or something would come on. And then a few songs later, there'd be another Steely Dan song. And then, you know, improbably, soon after that, there would be another one. And there just wasn't that much Steely Dan in my music library, on my, on my iPod. So I, I really wondered, is the iPod shuffle really random? And this, this question just bugged me. And one day, I was at a Macworld Expo. With, you know, I've, I was traveling now and going uh, to these launches. And a few of us get, are lucky enough to afterwards to get ushered backstage and you know, kind of kiss the iPod of you know, Mr. Jobs afterwards and do a little interview. And after I talked to him whatever they, about whatever they were doing on that, uh, Expo, I said, Steve, I've got this problem with my iPod, and I described to him the Steely Dan problem. And he nodded like he'd never heard it before. He said, well, let me get someone on the phone here. And, you know, so we called down the Cupertino. Uh, we were in San Francisco for the Expo. And he got someone on the phone. He wouldn't tell me the guy's name. They have this policy at Apple, or Steve has this policy. They won't tell you the names of the people who work down there, ostensibly because he's afraid someone will hire him away if we wrote about it. I don't know. But uh, I got this guy on the phone, Mr. X, and he said, uh, nope, totally random, no problem at all. You know, it's just your imagination. But I would ask people about this, and every single person I talked to who had an iPod would say, no, they don't think it's random either. So I actually wrote a column about this uh, for Newsweek, and I got an unbelievable response to this column. I actually want to read a couple of these uh, responses here because they're, they're kind of interesting. They fell into a few categories. The first was, uh, well, sort of self-explanatory. Uh, your article is very interesting, especially since both our iPods tend to favor Steely Dan. <laughs> yes, there are other people with the Steely Dan problem. Uh, I play my iPod, a second generation, using the random order, and the first song all the time is a Steely Dan song, Reeling in the Ears. Uh, here's another one. Um, oddly, my mini iPod seems to favor the Dansters as well. Um, and this, is, this email is kind of interesting because I saw from the signature that the person who sent it is a pretty high executive for a, a very well-known national health care firm. So it's a very important person writing this. But she says, well, you know how secretive Apple is. Maybe one of the reasons they keep things so close to the vest is they're contemplating and gradually achieving total world domination. <laughs> I thought you'd be interested in that, about that up here because as you dominate the world for sure. Um, uh, other other 
bands, of course, you know, were the favorites uh, on other people's iPods. Here's one that says, uh, you know, my iPod has a distinct likeness for Pearl Jam and Radiohead. Here's one, Linkin Park. Mine seems to be sweet on Lisa Stansfeld. Played, uh, Sansfield played four in a row of her tracks on shuffle mode. Uh, my iPod has a fondness for Green Day. Uh, out of about 2,160 songs, roughly 2,160 songs, uh, my iPod invariably plays Because the Night or People Have the Power by Patti Smith. Accident? I think not. <laughs> and of course, my shuffle loves Elvis. Elvis is in the iPod. And then there were people who talked about the songs the iPod didn't play. And I certainly noticed this too, and I wrote about that in the column. At one point, I downloaded uh, Wild Thing from the iTunes store. Uh, we spent 99 cents for it. And I was just waiting for the day this would come up on my, you know, iPod shuffle. And the, you know, those chords would begin and, you know, it could really perk up my day. It never happened to this day. Uh, and here's one. And so people wrote me about that. Here's one. This isn't about the iPod, but it's so strange I thought I'd read it anyway. I have a Sony multi-disc CD player that has a fondness for Led Zeppelin and dislikes playing Johnny Hartman. In fact, two Johnny Hartman discs were broken in two by the rotating tray. <laughs> and then there were ones that were just plain weird. Like, uh, my iPod has moods. Sunday and Monday nights, it gets bluesy. Rocks at night during the week. Does folk on Monday and Wednesday mornings. Bluegrass on Thursday mornings. Uh, it started playing Bob Dylan every other song when my girlfriend was in the car. And she complained about it. The next time she was in the car, it played Bob Dylan songs by other people. <laughs> and... Here's one, um, how irritating it is that my iPod only seems to play Christmas songs during the summer and never around Christmas. <laughs> and finally, this is the last one I'll read. Uh, as a person with a very high ESP level, and when a note starts like that, you know you're in for something, right? Uh, you know, I'm ask, have you ever confronted the fact that maybe you are the wild card in factor in your iPod's random shuffle and are influencing it to play or not play songs you want to hear? So I, clearly I was becoming the X-Files of the iPod shuffle. And when I did the book, I actually got into this deeper. I talked to cryptographers and mathematicians, and I became you know, convinced, actually, that the random shuffle really was random that what happens is, is explained to me, and it serves to make sense, is that we put patterns on things, and especially on something that has such emotional content for us, like music, it's the clusters that, we, that appear normally, there's some you know, agreement there, uh, is just an effect that, 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 that we you know, uh, bring to our iPods. So the randomness is in iPods, but not in ourselves. Uh, and you know, I tell this story because, again, it shows how emotional you know, this issue becomes how people get emotional about their iPods and about, you know, like the, 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 this product there. And that's something that really, you know, that brought me down the path uh, of, of writing about this because I felt it, it meant so much. And Shuffle, as it turns out, is something which is not only, I think, the signature feature of the iPod, but the signature feature, really, of our entire digital era. If you think about what we do on the Internet, is, for instance, in getting news articles. It used to be we would just get a newspaper, a magazine, and read what was in that physical package, so, you know, those bound-up trees, right? And in order to get something else, we'd have to you know, go to the newsstand and get something else. Now, of course, we go to the Internet, we read an article in Newsweek and go to one of the New York Times, the Seattle Post Intelligencer, the, to, off to a blog, we shuffle the news. Same with shopping. It used to be your shopping was limited to where you were physically, uh, you know, that department store or shopping mall. Now, of course, we go on the Internet and we shuffle the shopping. Um, I talked to Akamai recently, in, you know, uh, earlier this week, and they handed all the Super, Super Bowl advertising. They, they did the servers for that and uh, for a lot of the companies that did Super Bowl ads. And I realized that what we've done now is we've shuffled the Super Bowl ads. It used to be to see the Super Bowl, you would see the ads when they were served. Now, people were watching them even before they came out and watching them afterwards in YouTube and the Super Bowl ads during the Super Bowl had much less importance. We've shuffled Super Bowl ads. So, you know, we are really in a, a shuffle era. And, you know, uh, in honor of that, when I wrote this book, I actually shuffled the book. If you look over the table afterwards, maybe you can kind of like a peek in there. But I, I wrote this book a little differently than I did the others. I wrote it in sort of a nonlinear fashion because I realized I was writing really about the aspects of iPod in every chapter. And uh, so there's a chapter about the personal nature, there's a chapter about shuffle, there's a chapter about, uh, you know, uh, the identity you know, issues of the iPod. And, you know, uh, I decided why don't I go all the way and write each chapter as a standalone and then 
shuffle the chapters. That's what I did. The first chapter is always the same in every book. It's the introduction. But from then on, uh, you know, I, I literally one day this past summer, I you know, wrote the name of each of the other chapters on ping pong balls and had my son and my niece, who were 16 at the time, uh, and members of the iPod generation, pick these ping pong balls out of a bag and I did a bunch of you know uh, shuffles, and I picked four of them, and there's four different versions of this book. The one you have might be different than the one you have. So uh, you know you can judge yourself how that worked out, but I thought it would be a fun thing to do there. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to take a break now. I haven't really talked about uh, you know the competition uh, to the iPod there, but I'm happy to talk about that. And you know, or DRM, or you know, really any of the issues you want to bring up uh, about uh, you know, like the, this guy and his impact on society. Thanks very much. <laughs> Question. Some people are uh, got really passionate about the iPod, right? So what makes it, what makes the device something that people become passionate about? Because we look at a lot of devices and people are not passionate about them. Is it because music is such a personal thing and it brings up uh, you know, personal memories? Or is it something else? Because there are a lot of other devices doing various things. Well, I think you, know, you, you, you hit on it, and I mentioned this earlier. I think that the fact that it, it, it is involved in music, which is something that's so emotional, and it does it so well, uh, has a lot to do with that. Because this you know, opens up music for a lot of people. You know, personally, you know, look, I used to be a rock critic. I, 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 I just love music, but uh, I, don't, I don't commute in a car. It was difficult for me to, you know, just actually find the time to listen to, 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 to music. This way, uh, it was able to, you know, bring up a lot of my music collection and have it really accessible to me. And also, in conjunction with the Internet, it's been really easy to find new artists and, and, and get them and listen to them. But that's only part of it. Another part of it, I think, is just uh, the, the beauty of the device. There's something about... Uh, Apple has cracked the code, really, of making products tactily desirable, uh, you know, and you know, and, and physically, so that people just want to like touch them and get get attached to them there. So it's a combination of of, of those things and the fact that they're they're easy to use. I mean, I've talked to people who went to bed with their iPods. Um, one guy uh, wrote an article in the New York Times. He dropped his iPod on the subway tracks and jumped in, you know, the, down the tracks to get a, an iPod, you know. You could buy another one, buddy, you know. <laughs> uh, but there is that strong connection. And some people sort of dismiss it by saying, you know, it's just like this coolness factor. It's a fad, right? They, you know, Apple it manages to, you know, hype up what coolness is and uh, get people to buy that. And I think in a lot of cases, probably people did buy iPods or buy iPods for other people because it had that aura about it. But, you know, what typically happened, I think, is after people started using it, um, you know, because they got past, you know, the, the first couple steps. And, you know, if there are the first couple steps to absolute novices to, to, to get past. Uh, you know, then they found, well, this is really doing something for me. And, you know, and, and the, it's this rare device that becomes more valuable the more you use it there. So it sounds like, can I just yeah. finish that? So it sounds like you're saying it's not the device, it's the... The area of music is ripe for well, the vice people are passionate it, it, about, it, 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 and whoever came up with the first device that really did it well would have done that. Well, uh, like if they came up, you know, literally with, with, with this, I, I, I think so. Apple, of course, amplified uh, its message by marketing. Uh, they spent much more money combined than all the other MP3 manufacturers. You know, uh, you know much more money on their own than the, all the rest combined. Yeah. Can you talk about the transition of the iPod from a totally personal music player to now with all these aftermarket products, something that just powers something that's more of a group device? Well, that is interesting. I, I do have a, have a whole chapter called Personal Nature of That. I still think, by and large, the overwhelming amount of usage of an iPod is personal. And you know, uh, I have you know I, one of the, the one of the real delights in researching the book is I actually uh, had a great conversation, actually a couple conversations with a guy who invented personal audio, and this actually predates 
the, the Walkman. It's this, this wacky Brazilian guy who in, invented it, and he kind of like j you know, jerry rigged this you know, uh, cassette player, you know, you know, to for for headphones, and you know, and, and invented that. There's something really powerful about walking around and having your own music with you. Um, but you're right in the the aftermarket, this iPod ecosystem, which is a billion plus dollar. Uh, a billion uh, dollar business. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that you know you could you know just slot the iPod into you know some sort of device and listen to it. But an interesting thing happens when you're in a situation where someone's iPod is is playing there. It 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 is in part about listening to music, but you know, and this tags into the identity issues of the iPod. It becomes in, in part also uh, a, a window into the person whose iPod is playing. I was at a, a dinner party this past summer. And uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on the on the beach, and you know, uh, with this guy I I I just met, uh, you know, th th through through a, through a friend, and this guy was you know involved in the independent music scene, and he put his iPod into the you know the, the, some dock, and it was playing on the stereo, and it became less about what songs were playing, the you know the what songs you know he was listening to, right? So I think that you know you really can't separate. The personal aspect of the iPod, even when it's shared music there, because it's someone's put this all together, right? And each collection of music within the iPod is sort of a, a, a musical fingerprint of the person who owns it. Yeah. Um, to what extent? I mean, is there something special about Apple, either what they know about their customers, um, or Jonathan Ives, or whatever? What is it that Apple consistent enables Apple to consistently deliver products like this? So you ask Apple, you ask Steve Jobs uh, a question like that, the answer he'll give, and I think there's some truth to it, is, you know, especially in this case, is that we wanted a product that we wanted to use ourselves. This was the thing that we were dying to have. We love music, and the people who worked on it love music, and as it got closer to completion, you know, they could hardly wait to spring it from the, the lab and you know the, the the prototype and start using it there. And when that's your main desire, that's very very powerful. And so I, th I think I think that's at the center of it. Ask my question. There's another answer to that. Um, the first day, not the first week or month, but the first day that Steve came back to control, he called in the base the key analysts that covered Apple to tell them how he's going to turn the company around. And he gave him basically a two-word answer in industrial design, that he is the chief design officer. That is a company where they have the chief design officer named Steve, who has the same powers as the chief technology officer. That's one of the only tech companies that does. And that is, there is not a single part of the Apple organization which did not have to be executing with all cylinders firing together in order for the iPod. And the device almost has nothing to do with it. Your, the title of your book, notwithstanding, um, that the thing that's most interesting is that it's not the perfect thing. The object itself is horribly flawed. And, and that the fact that success happens despite that, and despite the styling, and the superficial styling, is actually what makes it all the more uh, compelling. And, and in fact, when Steve announced the iPhone, he in fact totally dissed the iPod's interface with right. doing so. By putting up the, the Nokia, it's all wasted with these hardware uh, controls and stuff like that, and you just have 60% of the screen. But just what, Steve? The iPod weighs 60%. Right? And right. He's, he's, he's tearing apart everything that about the iPod without letting you know it, because it's Steve, right? Right. And, and the press let him get away with it. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, okay. In, 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 uh, well, I did call the book the perfect thing, and I, I. I but I do, you know, I'm quite explicit in saying I agree that there are flaws in, in the iPod. And uh, I use the, the perfect thing in the sense of a perfect storm, where everything all came together there. You know, like, like, like the Internet, the power of chips and storage, of, you know, and, and that design issue, and, you know, and, and who Apple was and where music was. You know, it all came together, you know, for the iPod. And also, the, the second thing is, at moments like when the, the birds come on and your days transform, you say, well, perfect. Now, you know, the iPod is not a, a static object. This thing was, was replaced by this thing, right? This is a thousand songs. This is a thousand songs. This costs $400. This costs $200, right? Uh, you know, 
This is a little tougher to exercise with than this is. Um, yeah, this is black and white. This is color. Four hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, and this thing also is, is kind of interesting. The Nano is because the Nano replaced the most popular iPod. The most popular iPod was the iPod Mini, a couple of years ago, uh, and he just pulled the plug on it. Yeah, you know, it could have. This could have been the new Coke, right? It could have been, you know, something because people really love their iPod Minis. And when the Nano first came out, it was only in black and white, and a big part from the industrial design sense of the Minis. It was, it was color. It was a fashion object, right? So, you know, they, they they've been been moving forward there. Now, I agree totally that Steve is, you know, the, the number one design officer of, of Apple. The first time I talked to Steve Jobs, uh, you know, kind of a long interview with him, was in late 1983. And, you know, uh, it, he was working on the Macintosh then. I was doing a story for Rolling Stone about development of the Macintosh. And he gave me, uh, a, you know, a, a little speech about his design philosophy, which I actually quoted in, in, in the book there, which varies not a whit from his design philosophy now. It's one about kind of Zen's simplicity. To Steve, the ultimate interface would be like nothing, right? And how he, now he's got it down to one button. There was a big battle during the development of the iPod about how many buttons would be on here. And of course, you're not seeing switches and, and you know, heaven forbid that skies would fall if you put a screw on the back to replace a battery. You know, that would be the end of the world, right? Um, you know, you've got to have that smooth back there. And, you know, uh, he only wanted three buttons. You know, they, he was down to three. And they convinced him, please, let's put a fourth button for the menu. Please, please. And he, he went on that because I guess, you know, the, the, the symmetry of the compass points finally, you know, maybe appealed to him there. But the iPhone, he's down to one button. And, you know, I, I think we're going to see that go on, on things eventually that, you know, his perfect interface is nothing. And, you know, and his perfect d design is air, right? So, you know, uh, and he, he's got a fantastic partner in Johnny Ive, and they're on this mind meld uh, journey together to, you know, to, to simplify and, and beautify uh, electronics, and has a lot to do with it. Okay. Can you touch a little bit on the decision to, to make it available to the PC platform? Because originally it was a Mac-only device, and it seems to me that's sort of a linchpin for the thing really taking off, was making that decision, which right. in some cases was counterintuitive to what Apple was doing their other products. Right, absolutely. Uh, for those who might not have heard, you know, on, on, or on the, uh, the webcast, that yeah, you know, the question is the decision to change strategy. You know, and say uh, instead of you know, okay, this is something that's going to get people uh, to buy Macintoshes. You don't get it, no iPod for you unless you buy a Macintosh. Uh, to saying you know, we're going to broaden this to, to make it to, to Windows. Some of the people on the iPod design team, you know, some of the people making it, uh, late in the process figured, this has to go for Windows. We really want to do it that way. But Steve actually was resisting for a while. And I remember talking to him, uh, you know, the day I got the iPod, and he was very catty about that idea, about uh, having it for Windows there. And, you know, uh, pretty soon after it came out, uh, the people at Apple even went so far as to commission a study to see the impact that that might be. And that's sort of rare for Apple. Usually they go by the gut. Uh, you know, it's not like here where there's lots of user testing and things like that before a product comes out. Uh, you know, and he, he was convinced on that. And they brought, brought him around. And obviously that was a key attribute because how many iPods could they sell if they're only going to the 5% of the world that has Macintoshes? Um, and it was a profound decision. For them, I mean, you know, they've sold 90 million of these things, and they, you know, how many would they have sold that was only for Macintosh? Uh, and that, in conjunction with the iTunes Store, uh, you know, really made this, I think, a, a, a breakaway product. And then they didn't go, you know, uh, timidly into that world. They wanted to make iTunes, you know, their boast was this is going to be the best Windows application ever made. And I don't know whether that's the case, but they, it's a pretty darn good one. And, you know, they also said it's going to work just like the Mac one made. And, you know, I'm sure that wasn't the easiest way to do it either. And the other thing, the one thing that really amazed me was that they came out with that product ahead of schedule. They promised it by the end of the year, what was it, 2003, I think, and it came out like in October. So, you know, you guys can appreciate what, you know, that, 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 that's something quite impressive. Uh, in the back here, we're good. Uh, you rather provocatively mentioned DRM before opening to questions. I just want to see if you'd like care to share your feelings about the issue. Yeah, my, my feeling is that the, the natural course of events 
would, you know, the, the, you know, the, the river of technology flows in, in the direction of we got to eventually not have it. I mean, you know, the, eventually music is going to flow uh, like water, right? And, you know, because that's, that's what our technology lets it, lets it do. And, and in, in one sense, this is an opportunity for the music industry uh, at large. Unfortunately, it's not the way the music industry is constructed. So, you know, uh, there is this very difficult period uh, where, you know, in, instead of having your revenues trickle away year by year, uh, it, at, at some point, there's going to have to make a jump from one business model to another. Now, this war, so if you read this Thoughts on Music by Steve Jobs, that came out a couple of days ago. He did a, sort of an extraordinary thing by doing this open letter. I, I called it sort of like a, a blog posting from Olympus, uh, where he, you know, Steve Jobs came down and, and, and really, you know, for a lot of reasons, and the, not all of which were about, D, you know, DRM, uh, you know, Urge the music industry to drop DRM uh, and you know just uh, release its music unprotected. Uh, you know he's been getting a lot of flack because the iPod isn't interoperable, and I I'm critical. That, to me, that's one of the flaws of the iPod. The iPod should be interoperable, and you know I find his uh, reasoning why it, it can't be you know uh, to be totally flawed. Ultimately, it comes down to his saying is, well, if we made it interoperable, it would be easier to crack and much tougher to patch when it is cracked. But, you know, the, the question to come back at him is, well, if that's so, why is the music industry, which, you know, are the victims of this inability to patch it and keep it secret, why are they the ones pushing for you to make it interoperable as well as, you know, actually the customers aren't pushing it, but I think eventually they're, they're getting more clued in and, and want to push it. I feel if you buy a song, you know, on, a, on an online music store, whether it's at the iTunes store, or the Zune store, uh, or Napster or Rhapsody, you should be able to play it anywhere. And, and that's a very customer unfriendly uh, uh, system. And um, I blame the music industry for not mandating that from the get-go when they had some leverage over him uh, in the original uh, licenses for the iTunes store. Um, and, you know, uh, I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to see, see it interoperable, whatever the consequences. Yeah. Uh, can you touch a little bit upon what this has done to the music industry in terms of the economics of the music industry? 99 cents a song. I believe the margins are pretty vapor thin for Apple. They make like three or four cents per song. Yes. So what do the music labels make with that kind of a model? Right. So the music labels get about two-thirds of that 99 cents, right? Which I think is pretty impressive, right? You know, and the artists, you know, depending on the contract, maybe get a few cents. You know, so here's, here's what they get. They get... So what do they have to make for that, right? There's a, there's a little process of, you know, kind of getting them ready to, you know, you guys probably know more about this than I do, about what it would takes to, you know, get that music ready and delivered to Apple in, you know, a, a format that, you know, you could then uh, uh, ship it out. But uh, beyond that, what? You... It costs nothing, right? There's no manufacturing costs. There's no warehousing costs. There's no returns. It seems to me, ultimately, those margins are going to, are going to be pretty high. It's my feeling that the more successful uh, business model would be selling songs at a much lower rate than 99 cents. Um, and Rhapsody uh, did this experiment a few years ago where they sold songs for 49 cents instead of 99 cents. And they had to eat the difference themselves because the music industry wouldn't go along with this uh, in, in terms of uh, lowering their rates. And they sold six times as many tracks during that experiment. So you guys do the math, right? You know, if you're getting you know, uh, three times as much revenue, right? It's selling at half price six times as much. Uh, that seems like a pretty good idea, right? And it's not like you have to make more stuff to go out there. So I think, and more, you're, the people are more willing to experiment with different songs. So I think the price should go down for more success, but the music industry actually wants to increase the price. They want the, the ability to increase it. And, you know, uh, I think that's unfortunate. So I, I think, you know, uh, I, I think actually eventually, if you really look in the long term, uh, subscriptions have to be you know, the, the, the great model because I love the idea 
of listening to whatever you want, whenever you want it, right? That, 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 that sounds like a pretty good deal. And one that I'm willing to spend 10 bucks a month for, um, and especially when we have some sort of system where Internet is, is everywhere. And I could, you know, like listen to it. And, and, and if I'm walking down the street and want to hear Wild Thing, uh, I could just say Wild Thing and those chords begin, right? Uh, that's where it's got to go, right? Yeah. What does the next generation iPod killer look like in your opinion? The next generation? Where's, well, I've seen the first generation iPod killer. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in your mind's eye, I mean, you know a lot about this. Frame it up for us. What do you think? What do you think it would take to kill the iPod? What would it take to kill the iPod? <laughs> I think in this, in this iteration, in this, in, this, in this sort of form factor, and you know, uh, you know and, and right, right now, I think they, they, they've pretty much got this round locked up. You really got to take them on if, if, if you were going to go after the iPod on the next step. Maybe it would be with a phone. Maybe it would be with, with, with the something else. Maybe it would be by subscription or something. I don't know. Uh, but um, it's difficult. Uh, it's, it's really tough. So this guy comes out, uh, the Zoom, and it's got Wi-Fi. I, I, like, I like that idea of, of Wi-Fi. My criticism of Wi-Fi on the, the Zoom was that... Uh, the one thing you could do so out of the gate with Wi-Fi, and I do understand that you know this thing was manufactured so the Wi-Fi will be able to use be used for many different things. But the first thing out of the gate, you know, the, the thing you make the impression on is this idea. I, I don't know if this is the term we were supposed to use, but Steve Ballmer used it was squirting songs, you know, uh, from one person to a, to another is limited by three songs. Uh, you know, or three days, whichever comes first. And that was something was clearly delineated by lawyers. That was not by the principle of what do I want. So, you know, in, in my second guessing, um, uh, I'm searching for Zoom devices. Um, in my second guessing, uh, this, you know, it's easy to do from, from where I stand because I'm, I'm the press that gave uh, the iPod a free ride. Uh, the, you know, a better idea uh, would be to use the, the Wi-Fi for something where it's unencumbered. I love the idea that how MP3 devices that, you know, with hard disks hold the music collection. And you know, when you borrow someone else's iPod, you could, you know, it's transparent. You could see everything that's in their collection, right? That's so great, you know, to, to be able to say, wow, you, you like this? Or, you know, and like, you know well, I never had you pegged for, you know, you know death metal. And, uh, and one thing you could do on iTunes uh, with, a, with a computer is actually there's, there's a setting where you could look into someone's music collection there. Uh, sometimes I'm at a tech conference and, you know, people will leave this on and I'll be able to see there's someone in the room who, you know, the, the, you know has every Patsy Cline song, right? Uh, I wonder who that is. I think you could do that with something like this. Um, you know, I would love to get on the subway. And, of course, you'd have the option, I, I gather, to turn it off. But uh, I'd love to get on the subway and, you know, just look around and, and you know, can say, wow, who's got this music collection there? Uh, that would be kind of cool and sort of a fun uh, social uh, music setting. Ooh. Um, Someone's sending me music as we speak. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I just had a quick question about... Your role, your role in the press, and what you think about uh, people who write about Apple. And I'm not going to deny, like, I think their stuff is pretty good. You know, like they do a good job. But um, it seems like Apple is extremely popular uh, in terms of a topic to write about. And I mean, when you, when you look at stuff like Mossberg, I mean, I have a hard time finding an article that he writes that doesn't talk about Apple, even if it has nothing to do with the technology. So. Why do you think it's so popular, such a you know such a popular thing to write about, and why do people want to read it? Is, is my guess. Okay, so the question is, why are people like me in the media, or the the the, the cadre of tech writers, such you know fools for Apple? Right, is what, what what you're asking there. So, look, this is. This company is a great story. I mean, there's a, a drama behind it. You know, just just the from the the, the, the idea that this this co-founder of the company gets fired from the company he founded, comes back. The company people writing obituaries for Apple, right? The Wall Street Journal wrote this long obituary. He comes back and you know transforms it into a, a profitable company with a you know like a, a, a huge impact. That's a great story. Okay. 
Second, a lot of us use Apple. A lot of us uh, uh, you use Macintoshes. Um, you know, maybe you, you know, you suspect uh, they're, they're in, you know, it, it, it's something that, you know, uh, to tech, tech writers and a lot of people in the tech world, you know, they, 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 they like, you know, for whatever reason, that, that technology and are, I guess you're a little more interested in it when, when, when you use it. Um, second, the, the, the products are, you know, are interesting. You know, and in the case of the iPod, it's a, a product that broke boundaries. It, it was a, a gutsy move. People thought, what a dumb idea for Apple. The, you know, the day of, of the, the, the launch, there were analysts saying, you know, well, it may be interesting, but what's, this company should stick to its knitting, right? So that, that, that's a, a, a bold story there. And, and people love the, 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 the competition there. You know, people love, you know, uh, as much as we love Microsoft, you know, we love the, the, the competitive story there. You know, and you know, and the, the fact is that as successful as Apple is, it isn't as successful in terms of, you know, how many people use it and, you know, the, the money they make and the market cap is Microsoft. So, you know, there's that competitive story too. So it's got all the elements to draw someone like, uh, someone like me into writing about it, and you know our readers are certainly interested. So uh, you know I think it's, it's a genuinely newsworthy story. So uh, take it as you may. Yeah. I'd like to ask whether you think uh, Apple is the new Sony, and I mean that in two ways. One, do you think Apple is going to transform itself into this broad brush consumer electronics company, which computers are just going to be one little niche? And two, do you think? Sony is history. Uh, well, I hate to say that, that Sony is history. The question is about Sony. Sony, it, it is amazing, though, how Sony dropped this ball. This really was Sony's product area. And I, I talk about the Walkman in, in, in the book. And, 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 you know, how the Walkman of the 21st century was not a, a Walkman is sort of amazing, isn't it? And this was, you know, this, in a way, it goes back in part to DRM. Uh, you know, Sony was a little late into jumping into this because they had their own internal squabbles. It's a very siloed company, and you know, it's a turn. They're they're not great in software, so you know, there were there were things holding them back to take that step from a cassette uh, Walkman, uh, you know, or you know, or even you know, like a mini disc uh, Walkman to you know. A, 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 an MP3 Walkman, uh, and, but then when they finally came out with it, you know, it was so hobbled by DRM that it was impossible to use. It didn't even play MP3s with the first uh, Walkman, when, uh, digital Walkman, when it came out. I would hate to, I would not like to say their history. They're having a tough time. I'm actually not even counting out the PS3 because, uh, you know, it, 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 it's an interesting machine and there's uh, 200 million PS2s out there that have a very strong base. And, uh, but Certainly, they're a company which does not have the cloud uh, that it had. And Apple is a company which has positioned itself to be a big consumer electronics power. They don't need to sell near as many uh, iPhones as they do uh, Walkman, and they won't uh, to be pretty profitable. My guess is, in addition to the 600 bucks they're going to get uh, for the iPhone, and you know, and if you're going to buy an iPhone, you have to buy the more expensive one because uh, you know, if you're going to be watching movies and things like that, that you know, extra four gigabytes is going to be, be a huge difference to you. Uh, they're probably going to get a cut of the uh, AT and T's, you know, uh, subscription fees as well. So, you know, I, I think you know it, it has transformed Apple. You know, just look, they dropped the name computer from their name. It's no longer Apple Computer as of a few weeks ago. It's uh, Apple Inc. And now even the uh, uh, the Beatles have to. Uh, yeah, have, have a licensing deal with them. The, you know, the, 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 in the settlement there. Who sent me Adam Kroll? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you sent me the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. What do you hear about the reliability and warranty service? Okay. What? what do you hear about reliability and warranty service? The ability. The reliability, 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 reliability and warranty service. Oh, yeah. Hmm. The liability and warranties. Are you ask? Right. Reliability. Service. Reliability. 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 Liability and warranty? Liability. Reliability. Okay. Um, well, you know, they've had some problems. Um, uh, more so in the hard disk versions. Um, you know, uh, I don't think that, it, it, you know, uh, though people uh, talk about the iPod tax, they call it. Uh, you know, when these things die out of warranty, uh, people are so attached to the iPods, they go out and buy another. And there is a, a groundswell of dissatisfaction. Uh, 
you know, among, say, you know, the millions and millions of people, uh, you know, just by the numbers, there's going to be, you know, uh, ones that don't work. I, it's tough to evaluate uh, whether it's an unusual amount of ones that don't work or not. Anecdotally, it seems a lot of people uh, have dead iPods, um, and they have to go and re replace them. But uh, as you guys know, this is a, uh, these are pretty complicated devices, and you know, particularly the ones with the, with the hard disk drive. And uh, you know, people you know take them along with them, and you know, sometimes sometimes they break. Uh, uh, they do have a better warranty than they used to. Uh, now, you know, the, you can get the Apple Care with it. Uh, now you can replace the battery. That was something they were urged to do. Uh, and there was a lawsuit that, that brought them around to that. So for 60 bucks, you can get a battery replaced, uh, which can extend the life of the iPod. But I think my guess is, and they haven't acknowledged this, that their strategy is probably to, you know, update the product so much that, you know, uh, around the time, you know, the... the the iPod might die, uh, you'd be so hungrily eyeing the next version that you'd see this as a blessing. It says, well, great, my, you know, my, my th third generation iPod died, so now I could buy the, uh, the new one. Okay, so I'll take one more question, uh, and then uh, thank you all. Yeah? What, what's your opinion on the iPhone? My opinion of the iPhone? Well, I've only played with it, uh, you know, like a, a little. Uh, and you know, I think well. Again, it's a beautiful device. Um, you know, I, I don't carry a, a smartphone I, because they're, you know, they're just to me un unfriendly devices. They're they're tough to use, and and that's not a great enough trade-off for me to being always there. Uh, you know, for for email. You know, because that's that's the thing I've really mixed feelings about. But you know, uh, I think in terms of web browsing. And you know, and, and the, the the form factor of that, they've made some really you know, gr they have to use, have the great ideas, and you know, uh, they've made some big advances there. And I think uh, you know, their idea was to transform telephones the way they transformed listening to, to music was to come up with something which was so improved as an experience over what you had before that it was almost a, a different kind of animal. And uh, I think it has the potential to do that. Um, there have been some complaints, and I had difficulty doing, you know, like the pecking out a message there, but I'm not sure whether that's, you know, a, a problem with the product or the fact that, you know, you just need a little more practice after two days. You know, I would be just as proficient doing that as I would on, on, a, on a BlackBerry. Uh, but, you know, I think that it's created a huge hunger for people to have one in their hands already. And I think that in, in the short term, uh, they're going to uh, sell a lot of these at what's a, a really high price. You know, you have to give up your existing uh, con net carrier contract, then spend 600 bucks. Um, you probably won't even give up your iPod if you have a, a big hard disk iPod because uh, you can't have all that, that many songs on it. So, uh, you know, uh, as the price comes down, it'll be interesting to see how broad the market is for that iPhone. But right now, you know, it's pretty cool. You think they're going to sell a lot? I think the, w the goal is 1% market share in 2008 of the billion sold. And that's actually not a bad business if, if, if you crunch those numbers. Um, but, uh, you know, I think they're looking at, um, in, say, by 2010, I don't know, millions, you know, like, you know, like up to tens of millions by, by, by then is, is, is my guess. And, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see what competition comes up against them in that, in that space there. Uh, personally, I'd like to see uh, an iPhone without the phone because I, I just love to have the great Wi-Fi browsing device with all the power of a, of a Macintosh. So like an 80 gig iPhone without a phone might be a pretty, a pretty interesting thing to have. Anyway, I want to thank you all for your great questions. And thank you.